for our community. Although our local systems appear to be better in this conversation, time and time again it has become apparent that this can unfortunately happen anywhere. I believe that our athletes will tell you today, and I will tell you today, that this is a challenge to all who listen. This is not a rally for, local, for a local change, but for something much bigger. We live in a global society, and our students and staff represent that global society, thus making this a global issue that deserves attention, even if it is not perceived to be pertinent on most days here in Lincoln or at UNL. This is why our students speak today. With that in mind, I encourage you all to be respectful and listen. Be open-minded about what is being said this evening, as this is a challenge to the system. Let me be clear. This is not an attack. This is a challenge. A challenge to be what you say you are and become what you know you can be. Because you see, we're taught to expect our words to be heard and the message received and understood by all the here. It seems so simple, what we oftentimes neglect isn't the beginning or the end, but all the parts and pieces in between. The unseen layer beneath the surface, the part that becomes whole. The bigger picture that allows you to understand me and me. So who am I? And what makes me, well, me? It's that elevator speech that you've rehearsed time and time again, the important parts, the parts in between of your life worth knowing that scribble color onto the soul within the vessel. So how do you respond to your soul being mishandled, misinterpreted, misunderstood, misrepresented, mistreated, miscolored, before the words even leave your mouth? That's me. A being that's already been shaded by this world, not because of who I actually am, but because of what I'm painted to be. Me. My canvas was made in Colorado Springs, Colorado, privileged enough to not have been stained by the ugliness of racism, or better yet, I wasn't cognizant of its miscoloration. Cognition is the hand that paints how we view the world, taints judgment, distorts sentencing, immortalizes conviction. For me, failure to be cognizant started as early as five. We just learned about Martin Luther King Jr., his impact on social justice reforms. We were shown pictures of the outcome. The crimson sea of blood rushing into the streets, sapphire tears of mothers, sisters, brothers, fathers crying over bleed sheets, the same ghostly sheets that burn crosses in the lawns to drive away the dark. The signs plastered with hate speech towards colored people, it was words like Negro and nigger that my teacher decided to focus on. Because I grew up speaking blue, white, red sirens before I saw red, white, blue, some green and white and red thrown in there too, I got that Negro meant black. And black meant limits, limits placed on you, a nose to a wall, a street painted by you, with you because people are afraid of the shades, the dark shades, the dark. But I couldn't understand the word. We were told, it's just a word, we didn't have to worry about what they meant, but words have weight, and weight has meaning. My curiosity wasn't satisfied with that answer. My questions needed answers. My questions needed my mom. Zeta, masterpiece of the West Coast, contemporary of orange and white and green, the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire of the West Coast of Africa, came to America to become a pharmacist, now working on her second PhD, the paint supplier, my foundation. So when I called her at work, told her that I'd been meaning to ask her the meaning of this meaningless word nigger, she brushed that word, not black, but scarlet, and gave me what was arguably the most questionable ride on the pain train I had ever received. I felt white, washed, a blank canvas. Why am I getting spanked for this? What did I do wrong? They're just words, right? It wasn't until third grade that racism decided to knock on the front door of my backwards ebony back door understanding, started with the pale hues of being a distraction, isolated from the ivory of my ebony misunderstandings, leading to my nose pressed to the gray plastered wall, hearing classmates sketch me out in the chalk lines of laughter, joy, pain. Etched as a threat for just being born, black which led me to being framed, which led to the lead-based paint of name-calling, which led to tripping in the art gallery halls, which led to someone accusing me of starting a fire in the bullshit brown bathroom, which led me to then being escorted every time I had to use it. Piss, yellow. Which led to the principal's office, where I unfortunately made my second paper in the shade home. With every resend, I began to resent teachers, classmates, becoming a black technicolor product of my environment, an object with a default color on the factory line in this life, incoherently becoming what the school and parents penciled and stenciled me out to be. A kaleidoscope of broken black, broken blue, broken hues, and the humanity of the gray stoked, daunting depression, painted on the high wall with the low ceiling. 
I know now. Oh, I know now. That these were just a collection of micro-pixels, micro-aggressions that built up, beginning to weigh so heavily on my soul that it eventually began to take the color of the negative weight placed upon me. Why can't I be judged by the principle of my character, the contents of my soul and not the color of my skin? You can't judge me, the artist, my own masterpiece, drawn up on an ebony canvas, detailed with blood, sweat, tears, the years of paint mixing, mixing paint to mix the paint, to paint the history of what came before and everything else that came after. I want it to be understood that you can't be disappointed with a Pollock when you expected a Monet. Understand that my soul may be tattered, battered, spit spattered with the lead painted pattern of the hatred of color, but I will not be what paint splatters me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Samuel Phillips. I am a sophomore on the Medicine Mass 16 here at UNL. I will be giving a very personal speech about the mental toll that being black can have on living in America. Before I start today, there's something I want all of you to know. I'm here today to not just give you all a speech, but to invite you into the mind of a black teen living in America. You see, I stand before you today not as an athlete nor a student, but as a person, a black person who lives in America. In America, where since age one, I have seen my race be tortured, beat down, made fun of, taken advantage of, and illustrated as bad or less than. I've had to learn how to be comfortable in my own skin, learn how to accept myself, my family, and my culture. And I had to learn how to accept the bashing and discrimination against my people. Please take a minute and think if you ever have had to accept the fact that people are going to use and abuse your race and culture. And there's nothing that you can do about it. If you have never had to, then that's a certain privilege that zero, and I mean zero, black children have. The mental toll and abuse that that has on a black child growing up is immense. So we arrive at the topic of my speech, the title of the part of my brain that I am taking you into, and it is titled, titled The Very Baggage of Being Black. On August 23rd, the nation was struck with yet another video of a black man being shot by police, an act of senseless violence, a moment taken too far, and an executive order that should have never been made. That night, I had a nightmare, and in this nightmare, I was being chased by two white men in trucks who were white supremacists. They were in a blue pickup truck chasing me down the streets at night. And something interesting that I noticed about the stream was that the streets kept switching between the ones in my hometown in Los Angeles and the ones where I currently live, Lincoln. I was engulfed with fear and confusion. I was horrified and I had nowhere to go. My mind took me behind the cars and I saw their bald heads through the back window of the truck and my body running helplessly between the two front headlights. I then woke up in the middle of the night in panic. I looked straight in front of me in my black room, scared for what was to come. I was terrified and I felt like I was in a horror movie. I then went back to sleep and woke up with a bad feeling in my gut. I needed to see my dreams and analyze them, taking in all the hidden meanings and symbol symbolisms of my quote unquote visions. But I usually don't tell anyone that Mr. Phoenix says I keep my visions to myself. But this dream, this dream was different and I can tell. And that feeling of impending doom, well, I checked my phone to see that there had been a shooting at a protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. My dream was trying to tell me something, and I was going to listen. Unfortunately, that is not the first time I've had a terrifying dream surrounding this subject, but is that really a surprise? When we grow up and constantly see in the news kids, teens, and adults who look like us being killed and murdered in the streets, what do you think is gonna happen? Horror movies are rated R for a reason, because young kids should have seen murder and horror at such a young age. No, nope, not for black kids. We sit there and are forced to watch black trauma as it is shoved in our faces by the sympathetic white allyship of the media, trying to use our death, our pain, and our agony for their own agenda. We sit there and watch it over and over again until we eventually become numb to it, until we can't watch it anymore. I am already tired of death and trauma and abuse, and I'm only 18 years old. We sit there and watch our people get unjustly killed by cops until we have to casually inform our friends of our potential risk of getting killed by a police officer. Do you know the toll that that has on a person? 
We have to constantly watch our every move, to watch our backs, so we don't get profiled and accidentally killed by a cop, whatever that means. Kids and teens shouldn't have to carry around baggage like that. Our other friends are living life carefree, but we have to always make sure we are in check, not doing anything wrong, stepping in the right direction. We are not afforded that privileged lifestyle. And this alludes to this changing streets with my dream. I'm constantly carrying the baggage of having to watch out for people who don't like my skin color, who hate my race, wherever I go. It's very harming to the psyche of our maturing minds. It creates distrust, inability to trust, anxiety, and stress. So what did the dream show me? It showed me that I had been running from the same thing all my life. It showed me that that horror like this will follow me anywhere and everywhere I go. We are not safe in America until there are zero racists and zero acts of racism. So I had the dream, I analyzed it, and now it would be time to take action. This is an additional challenge for black people all around. Others have the choice to stay away from these topics and it's enough for them to be anti-racist, but at the end of the day, it isn't their people who are being killed on screen, it's ours. So where does that responsibility fall to educate, to spread awareness and to take damage and grief of the killings? It falls on the black community. So now, not only do I wake up and have to do schoolwork, practice, and worry about the daily struggles of life, but I have to worry about educating people and spreading awareness on the mistreatment of the people within my community. I am constantly having people bombard me with questions that they can answer themselves but choose not to. Now why is that? It's because to them, it's not their responsibility. It's ours. It's the new black generation who have brought an upheaval to modern day society with our voices and use of social media. We have to sacrifice our energy and our free time to worry about the horrors our community go through. And man, I am tired. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten texts from people asking for my opinion because they're in a fight with a racist or far right friend. They ask me for advice for the sole reason that I'm black, which I am. I guess it's the start to progress, but it's 10.30 at night. It's the middle of the day. What about me? What about my time? What about my consciousness that needs to focus on one of the other many things going on in my life? And when we choose not to speak on it, not to take to social media for statements, or not to pay any mind to it, there, it, there is a guilt that engulfs me. That guilt of not having to worry about the situation because of my privilege in life. The guilt of watching my people sit and not doing everything in my power to fix I should be able to live just as carefree as you, shouldn't I? There have been days where I've been so mentally, physically, and spiritually exhausted from being immersed in black death and trauma. I've fallen ill from mental exhaustion of having to talk after talk after talk, expressing pain and anger, from physical exhaustion of walking for miles in the streets, protesting for people's people in this country from spiritual dream of not having any free time or relaxing time to myself. I end up reserving no time to just be a normal team. This baggage of being black weighs heavy and told me. It's like climbing a mountain with an oversized backpack, one that's filled with anger, shame, regret, guilt, trauma, and pain. But I can proudly say that over time, that baggage becomes lighter. It becomes lighter when you begin to fall and fit into your skin. And you realize the power, the glory, the beauty, the humility, and the flavor that comes with being black in America. It takes that baggage away and fills it instead with more uplifting feelings of acceptance, unity, honor, a sense of community, and an understanding of rich and intense history of love, not only for yourself, but for all people. And yes, that weight that responsibility to uphold that rich culture and fight for equality that our ancestors started years ago is heavy. But with uplifting emotions like love, unity, and peace, it becomes easier to carry. Lighter and lighter until we get to the top of the hill. And what is at that top of the hill? A new world. A world where black kids can live in peace with a clear sense of mind. 
where black teens won't spend their days fighting 100 year long battles, not being able to experience the carefree joy of just being a regular, normal teen. A world where black people don't have to live in fear, but the constant reminder of the pain and agony our people have gone through. A world where there is no more baggage to carry because there is nowhere else to go. We are finally home. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ben Stilley, and I'm a senior defensive lineman here at the university, and most importantly, an ally of the black community. I'm extremely grateful and honored to be able to speak to you today, because let's face it, I have no right to be speaking to you on the topic of police brutality and racial injustice, as I have not personally faced either of these. Today I feel the need to speak out and will continue to speak out until true equality for the black community is reached. Until equality is upheld for strangers, my teammates, my friends, and my brothers and sisters of the black community. I'm tired of seeing people I care for so deeply be treated unfairly, whether it be consciously or subconsciously. I never understood white privilege growing up in Ashland, Nebraska, where the African American population makes up less than 1% of the community. I never would have understood white privilege like I do now if it wasn't for all the diversity that a college football locker room brings. I'm grateful for the social awareness college football has brought me, and I'm sad that not everyone gets to experience something like it. I'm not going to pretend that my increased awareness of my white privilege, privilege helps me understand what it's like to be black in America. But I see you, I hear you, I empathize with you, and I stand with you. White privilege, white privilege I personally experienced is when I got pulled over and caught as a minor with alcohol in my car and did not receive my minor in possession charge. White privilege is having an interaction with police and not fearing the consequences of this interaction. White privilege is being taught white history in the core curriculum and black history being offered as an elective. White privilege is being able to walk into a store without being watched or followed by the workers. White privilege, white, male, white privilege is taking advantage of Black Lives Matter rallies as an excuse to vandalize and steal. White male privilege is committing a crime and on average receiving a 19% shorter sentencing than black males who commit the same crime. White privilege is me being given a voice to speak about something that doesn't directly affect me when the black community has been ignored and silenced on the topic of social justice for the past centuries. It's time for change. It's time for white privilege to stop being used to get ahead in society and instead for it to be used to point out and change social injustices. In a society where my voice, for no other reason than the color of my skin, has more power, it is our responsibility to make sure the voices of the black community are heard. Change won't come about until all of us who aren't directly affected care as much as those who are. In order to do so, we must become educated on the history and current racial injustices of our country. We must actively seek change in our political system to promote equality. We must vote so our voices are heard. We must call out subtle bigotry amongst our peers. And most importantly, we must love our neighbors as we do ourselves and continue to observe and listen to the black community to support them and help create change. Thank you. Hi all, my name is Emily Sheremy. I'm a senior on the rifle team here at Nebraska. First, I just wanna say how honored I am to be speaking to all of you and that I am incredibly thankful for all of you coming out tonight. I had the pleasure of speaking in front of our entire student athlete body two years ago at our Diversity and Inclusion Summit. And I have to be honest, I'm way more nervous to be speaking here tonight in front of you. What has been happening to the black community in this country is horrendous. No one should ever have to fear for their life when leaving their home, going for a jog, playing outside, trying to help others, walking down the street, and certainly never fear for their life in their own home, sleeping in their bed. Black parents should never have to sit their children down and tell them that the world wants to hurt them for no other reason than for the color of their skin. Everyone in this country should denounce and speak out against the violence that is happening to the black community, especially those who claim to care so much about their well-being. Here at Nebraska Athletics, we have five pillars that we are supposed to live by. Displaying integrity in every decision and action, building and maintaining trust with others, giving respect to each person we encounter, pursuing unity and purpose through teamwork, maintaining loyalty to student athletes, coworkers, fans, and the University of Nebraska. The mission of our athletic department is to serve us, the student athletes, 
our coaches and staff, and you, our most loyal fans. By these five pillars, integrity, trust, respect, teamwork, and loyalty. Until we stand with and support all of our student athletes, staff, coaches, and fans, our athletic department is not upholding our mission or these five pillars. And when I say all, I mean all. I don't know if all of you have read the letter sent to the athletic administration, but it asks our athletic department to hold themselves accountable to our five pillars and reach the level of excellence that is desired at Nebraska. It lays out a plan that the athletic department needs to follow in order to reach the level of excellence that we, we as student athletes demand of ourselves and our institution. What is asked in this letter is not unreasonable. It is honestly the bare minimum of what our athletic department should be doing. And despite that, not even a statement supporting black lives has yet been made. I understand we are in the middle of a pandemic and are facing serious budget concerns, but there's another pandemic that we have been ignoring for years, that of systemic racism. And we should not be silent any longer. Our athletic department needs to take a hard stance against the violence that is happening to the black community. Our athletic department must stand in solidarity with its student athletes. And our athletic department must strive to always be better and do better by those it promises to care about. What we are seeing here tonight is not a product of what our coaches have done and not what our athletic department has done. What you are seeing here tonight is a product of Nebraska student athletes being sick and tired of not getting answers, of being ignored, of being told that our voices don't matter, of being pushed aside. Our athletic department says that they care about our well-being that they provide the best student athlete experience, that they treat their student athletes the best. But is that, is that entirely true? There should be no need to send a letter of request to make our athletic department better. If our student athletes were being as well taken care of as the athletic department promised, they would be acting faster, trying harder, and doing more to support the, their student athletes and better the department. The athletic department would stand firmly with their student athletes, would say so without question, without double meaning, without caring about ruffling feathers, without fear of pushback, without compromise, without performance. To our athletic administration, know this. Your permission was not needed for us to be here tonight. Tonight would have happened with or without your approval. The power and determination that exists among us as student athletes is limitless, is undeniable, is ceaseless. We can and will enact real and lasting change. We are no longer asking permission to do what we know is right, to stand up for what we believe in. Now, we are simply doing. The Black Lives Matter shirts you see tonight were not given to us in support of this rally specifically despite how the athletic department may be trying to spin it. They are also somehow the first instance that Nebraska athletics has said black lives matter. Maybe individual teams and coaches have, but no official statement by Nebraska athletics has yet said so. Why are we so adverse to saying the simple statement that black lives do in fact matter? You must care for and protect your student athletes as much as you do your own image. We are the face of Nebraska athletics. We are that image, so protect us too. Our fans look up to Nebraska athletics as leaders in this state, in this country. They expect loyalty and commitment, leadership and trust from us. And we expect the same from you. You think that by being here, you are showing your support, but that's not enough. You being here is as much a performance as anything else that you have done so far. Finally, support those who you pretend to. Acknowledge their pain, acknowledge their suffering, and be the person, be the athletic department that you claim to be. We remember the few short months ago when the hollow words were uttered in support of those victims of police brutality that every word was scripted and fashioned to cover our ass. The time for that is over. 
Nebraska athletics, your silence is deafening to your student athletes. Your performance is over. It is time to stand with your student athletes or be honest and tell us that you don't actually care about us. These are your options. I wanna leave you with a very simple motto that I was taught over a decade ago. It belongs to the 4-H program, something that I was a part of for a better chunk of my life. Their motto is simply to make the best better. Nebraska, you claim to be the best, so now it's time to be better. opportunity to be a small part of such an important event. I stand before you to use my voice against racism and for unity, equality, respect, togetherness, and love. I grew up in Spearfish, South Dakota, population 10,000. My graduating high school class had 129 students, none were black. I was raised in a loving home and was taught by my parents to embrace and celebrate diversity but in reality, I was simply not exposed too much to diversity in my community. However, when I became a member of the women's basketball team here at the University of Nebraska, I was gifted with an opportunity to play with and ultimately become lifelong friends and teammates with teammates from all different backgrounds, races, lifestyles, cultures. As we fought together side by side, working towards common goals, I gained something that had been missing in my life when it came to race. I gained perspective. I began to understand how my teammates with different backgrounds and races experienced the world and it was very different than what I experienced. As I moved into my professional journey, my coaching career took me to San Antonio, Texas, where I was motivated to positively impact young women through the many lessons that we can learn from sport. I was blessed to coach a very diverse group of young women and perhaps more personal I ended up meeting the love of my life, my husband, a black man. Once again, I gained perspective and understanding as I was now going through life with a partner that experienced the world with at times fear and unease. I'm now blessed to be the mother of two beautiful mixed race daughters. And as I work to assure them that their lives matter, again, my perspective has been further enhanced. All of my life and professional experiences have been educational for me, and I'm grateful for increased perspective and understanding that began as a student athlete here at Nebraska. But there is so much more for me to learn. In early June, our team was reporting to campus for the first time since COVID ended our season last March. At the time, our world was also reeling after the senseless death of George Floyd. I was excited about getting back to the one thing that gave me a sense of normalcy, basketball. However, what I initially failed to understand was that getting back to business as usual was not what our team needed. Having a diverse coaching staff and support staff helped me understand that when there are issues affecting our program that are bigger than basketball, business as usual was not a priority. Our priority was to create a space for our team to discuss, discuss, discuss systemic racism and engage in raw and honest dialogue, dialogue with one another. The goal was to gain further perspective and increased understanding. Now, what do we do with increased perspective and understanding? You see, black lives, they don't just matter. They're valued, cherished, celebrated, and needed. Taking action steps is how we become part of the solution to make positive and meaningful change for the black lives in our community. Some action steps may be immediate, like attending this rally or sharing a post on social media. Some action steps may be more private, like being fully educated on all issues that are important to you before exercising your right to vote. And some action steps may take time, even years, to see the payoff, like investing in mentoring to the young black lives in our community. Every person you meet, just like every student athlete that I'm blessed to coach, is an opportunity to enhance perspective and understanding. 
by embracing diversity and fostering relationships with people who are different than you, you can open yourself to the fullest beauty this world has to offer. It pains me to think of all that I would have missed out on if I had not been open and hungry for increased understanding and perspective other than my own. I will make a difference. You can make a difference. We can all make a difference. Thank you. Hi, my name is Taylor Johnson and I'm a grad student on the track team. I'll be speaking to you guys about what it means to be a black woman in America. Black women deserve their roses and more roses and even more roses, we deserve our roses. But we can't have a cultural name, a name that represents our blackness that is unprofessional. I shouldn't have to change my name on an application to get an interview I'm already qualified to get. I shouldn't have to be thankful that my parents gave me a racially ambiguous name. I should be angry that my name doesn't represent my culture. We deserve roses, but we are mocked for having colorful hair, braids, afros, and imagination, for being able to recreate ourselves with a drop of a dime, for having long nails, for wearing what we wear, and then seeing it recreated on someone of a lighter hue, praise for their style. It shows up on catwalks, in magazines, on social media, our ideas stolen without a second thought, and still we continue to recreate, be front runners, we deserve roses. But black girls are taught not to love themselves. By their peers, their counselors, they are told they cannot so many times before they hear they can. Despite the doubt, black women are some of the smartest people with or without a college degree, with or without a college degree, observe their intuition. But people assume that we are not smart. Smart. Teachers assume you don't belong in the AP class. Counselors assume your ability to get into college of your choice is too low. Teachers ask the class full of non-black students that they think it's okay to say the N-word in literature. Group members take credit for your ideas. The girl sitting next to you asks if your favorite fruits are watermelon and grapes and laughs. Not considered too strong. All the while, black girls block out the ignorance, learn, rise above. We are expected to educate, to have conversations, to convince people of our mistreatment, consider their feelings, we deserve roses. But the rate of black mothers dying because of complications during birth, they die because they're ignored, not considered, too strong. We don't deserve these roses. But we are strong, resilient, we can handle anything, right? No, no. No one should have to handle the death of their child, brother, sister, mother, father, unjustly killed. Is she supposed to be strong? Is she supposed to look the other way? Since she is so strong, she should recreate a solution. Give her the roses. Black women are the first to mobilize, the first to support, the first to help, the first to uplift. She is the first. Black women deserve their roses and more roses and even more roses. We deserve our roses. Finally, I'm living through a moment where blackness is being fought for, really fought for. For centuries, we've been told to conform to earn respect. The truth of the matter is, there's so much hate embedded into this country, it's not just on us to change how we're treated. For we are not responsible. Don't ask me to ignore the institutional racism that I see every day. Just because you're not a racist does not mean that your ancestors weren't. And just because I'm not a slave does not mean that my ancestors weren't. There's a divide, we started behind, people hate that we could ever catch up, our neighborhoods are gentrified, our schools underfunded, our people vilified and locked in cages, and we're supposed to feel free? Being a black woman in America means that I might always be considered an angry black woman. I might be hostile, I have the right to be. After being mistreated time and time again, am I supposed to not be angry? And for all the things we go through, black women still find it in their hearts to love others, educate others, listen to others. I love the brilliance of blackness, its ability to be everything all at once, but mostly because of the strength, courage, wisdom, love, and resilience that we've inherited from our ancestors. It's on their shoulders that we stand. We are so much more expansive in our thoughts, interests, creativities, and actions than many people really understand. I love our depth our breath, beauty, and brightness. You can see all of this through the poetry in our step, how our style forms, a cultural echo, our ability to triumph over adversity. This is the brilliance of being black. 
For centuries, black women have been forced to play the background, but while doing so, we've made some life-altering impacts on the world. That's a legacy that I'm proud to be a part of. So, here's to receiving more roses and to the continuation of our powerful legacy.